Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com, here with something of a sequel to my talk on conductors who hardly ever made a bad record. This is, uh, we don't want to talk about conductors who only made bad records. I mean, none of them only made bad records, although some come close. They do. But I don't want to be negative. Well, not entirely negative in any case. I want to talk about a sort of a subtle niche category, similar to the previous, but a little bit different. These are five conductors who were their own worst enemies. And by that, I mean, they, they undercut their own legacy in a variety of ways. So let's start with the big elephant in the room. A lot of you have castigated me, appalled, shocked, horrified, stunned that I left off that list Eugene Ormandy. And you have a point because Eugene Ormandy was a wonderful conductor who seldom made a bad record below a, you know, he had a standard and he almost never did anything below that standard. No question about that. And I give him props for it. But he recorded the same stuff over and over and over and over and over. Now, he had a reason to. I actually feel a little bit a little bit charitably towards him because he did what he did for Sony. He later redid for RCA, which he later redid for EMI, Angel in the U.S. So he had a bit of an excuse to do it. But I, I have a problem with that. I have a problem with artists who undercut themselves. And Ormandy was also let down quite often by his engineers, especially the RCA recordings. The Columbia ones actually, in retrospect, don't sound all that bad. At least some of them don't. But but the RCA stuff was really problematic, and so was so was a good bit of the EMI stuff. It's, and it was the dawn of the digital age, and no one knew how to make digital recordings. They sounded screechy and terrible. I mean, if you compare his Also Sprach Zarathustras, you know, all three of them, or his Tchaikovsky symphonies and things, you find that as often as not, when he remade something, it wasn't as good as his original. And now we can compare the mono stuff to the stereo stuff in addition to only stereo stuff. So having all of this stuff available, all of these recordings, all these multiple multiple renditions of the same repertoire, really lets us, it confirms to us that there was a consistency issue. You know, you like to say, well, nothing was below a certain level of achievement. Well, that's true, but you can still make comparisons of multiple versions of the same work and they're not all equally terrific. Now, I also give Ormandy props for continually doing stuff, uh, or I keep saying stuff, but you know, works, there we go, that he hadn't done before, um, and uh, you know, for his new labels, and those are the interesting recordings for those labels. But do you really wanna hear you know, Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, however many times he did Tchaikovsky's Fourth Symphony, there's also Delos out there where he did some of that stuff. It just, it's just too much. It's too much and it's not consistent within his level of consistency. He's competing with himself and that's not smart. I don't think because I as a critic am called upon to make the comparisons and to make recommendations. And if he did something three times and once is terrific and the other two aren't, then what's his average? Even if the overall level of accomplishment is quite high. So Eugene Normandy is number one. Number two, you saw this one coming too, Herbert von Karajan. And Karajan is worse than Normandy, much worse than Normandy, because a lot of his duplications were within the same label. They were for, for Deutsche Grammophon or possibly EMI. I mean, it was ridiculous. The number of Beethoven cycles, the number of Brahms cycles, the number of Tchaikovsky the last three symphonies, he just did it over his four Dvorak eighths, 27 Schumann, Mendel, whatever German thing. I, it was crazy. It was absolutely crazy. And Carion, interestingly enough, is in some ways a little more difficult than Normandy because once he had the Berlin Philharmonic, he hardly evolved at all. I mean, from one performance to the next, it was almost exactly the same stuff. There were a few notable exceptions. There were some things that he did better the second time around, like uh, the Symphony Fantastique or Shostakovich 10th, some of the unusual repertoire. But by and large, by and large, the remakes were not better. They weren't even that different. 
nor were they sonically ever really wonderful. I mean, they were okay, um, but never spectacular in the way we knew that even his own label, Dutch Gramophone, was capable of doing for other conductors. I I think, frankly, that 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 Carion was very very limited as an interpreter. He could be very very good. He made beautiful records. He had a sound. He had a standard like Ormandy. It was pretty much up there most of the time. The execution of the Berlin Philharmonic was a thing in itself. People liked the Carion sound, and they liked to listen to those recordings because they wanted to hear him give the, the repertoire of the treatment, which he did, and seldom failed to do. And sometimes the repertoire responded to the treatment, and sometimes it didn't. One of the reasons his Decca box is so splendid is because it contains repertoire, most of which he remade for Deutsche Gramophone and EMI Warner, but it was with the Vienna Philharmonic, which, as you largely agreed, um, was able to collaborate with him in a way that produced rather distinctive and, and characterful performances that were quite often better than anything he did later. But if you look at one of the pieces that's in that box, like the Beethoven Seventh, I mean, how many Beethoven Sevenths are there? Five, six, seven, a hundred, three thousand? I mean, unbelievable, right? And they're not all equally appealing. Not a bit. So Carion doesn't make it to the list of conductors who almost never made a bad record because he made a lot of records and a lot of them are very good and there are probably more good ones than bad ones or, or, or there are more consistent ones than bad ones. But five, six, seven versions of the same work? No, absolutely not. He chopped himself off at the knees. He really did. Next, Claudio Abbado. Claudio Abbado was not as criminal in terms of duplication, although he also had his share of Beethoven cycles that were not very good, and he kept doing Mahler symphonies that were not very good, and you know things like that. But and his late period was just just terrible, mostly with the Lucerne Festival Orchestra and with the the Chamber Orchestra of Europe or the Mahler Chamber Orchestra, whatever the hell it was, he did almost some classical repertoire that he was never good at. I mean, he made a lot of bad records, don't get me wrong. Um, he really did. But he also r duplicated repertoire ridiculously. I, I never quite forgave him, and this is me, for making two recordings of Il Viaggio a Rams, a fabulous world premiere recording on DG, and then another one just a few years later on Sony with half of the same cast, uh, and uh, again, again, you know, you, you, I believe, I believe as a recording artist, you have to have enough pride in what you do to say, okay, this represents my interpretation set down for posterity, and I'm not going to do another one. I just will not. And that's that. And you live with it. You live with it. Because otherwise... Otherwise, you, you, you are damaging your own reputation. You are undercutting the ability to market and sell your recordings of the previous label, which invested heavily in you. Um, and, and Claudio Abbado was so ethereal, he was up there in space, that he just didn't care how many times he recorded the same stuff over and over and over and over and over. Absolutely absurd. And half the time, it wasn't even very good. It wasn't even very good the first time, let alone the second. You know, as Beethoven, it was pretty uninteresting. Okay, yeah, he got it right the third time. We should have to wait so long? I mean, come on. He was worshipped, worshipped by many, many in the industry, and I, I can't gainsay that. People have a right to their opinion. But when you talk about conductors who were their own worst enemy, Abbado was definitely his own worst enemy. The big Abbado story about him being his own worst enemy is what the, the Mahler Adagio scandal, which some of you mentioned, where, you know, Deutsche Gramophone did a, a compilation disc called Mahler Adagio. Like, who wants that? I see. But they did it, and they were trying to sell it, and they might have been able to. Who knows? Um, those things tend to work. They sell a bunch. And Abbado sued them because he thought that having isolated movements from his Mahler symphonies you know, demeaned his conception of the work. No, Mr. Abbado. What demeaned his conception of the work was making crappy recordings of the same symphonies over and over and over. Now that demeaned him more than taking an adagio out and selling it separately. But that was the way he was. He was absolutely death 
to his labels, who invested all of that money in him only to have him duplicate repertoire or sue them or do that. I mean, come on. It's like, grow up, you know? It was ridiculous. Okay, so Abado's number three. Number four, Schulte. Now, Schulte is another one of those conductors. I mean, I've never been a fan of Schulte. He did make some wonderful records. He truly did. He was really a very good conductor of the opera house. His opera recordings were exciting, but we're talking about symphonic music by and large. Even the operas, you can talk about this too, because one of the indisputable facts of life with Schulte is that whenever he did a remake, it was worse. I don't think there's anything he did, I'm trying to think hard, that was an improvement over his first version. Most of his Mahler symphonies were, were lousy, it, lousier in Chicago than they were with the LSO. And if it was lousy with the LSO, like the third, it was lousy with Chicago. Uh, most of his, his, I mean, he did Beethoven symphony cycles, of course, a couple of those. The first one was better than the second one. I think that's pretty, pretty clear. Operas. Oh, my goodness, he did operas on top of operas, and some of them were just marvelous. Uh, the remakes, mm -mm, not so much. And at the end of his life, at the end of his career, he was recording with the Kitzerkebau, he was recording with other orchestras, and he was doing stuff, you know, weird couplings of things, really strange couplings of things. And, and I don't understand why Decca was even releasing them. I actually, I actually believe that they were relieved when he died because, you know, he hadn't done Nielsen, he hadn't done Sibelius. There were talks that he was interested in doing that stuff. And, and Decca, there were talks that Decca was really dreading that he might want to do that stuff. And, and he would, he would, they would wind up making scads more recordings of repertoire that he hadn't touched yet. And to which he would apply the same kind of muscular insensitivity that characterized a lot of what he did otherwise. And, and fortunately, um, it ended. And I think that sounds terrible. I know. I mean, I don't wish anybody should die. I wish people should retire. They should be smart about these things and they should know their strengths and weaknesses. But they're artists. They're not supposed to know their strengths and weaknesses. So Schulte is number four, artists who are their own worst enemies. Last but not least, here's a very interesting case, I think. A really interesting case. Gunter Vond. Gunter Vond, you know, a lot of you mentioned, what about Gunter Vond? He never made a bad record. Well, he, again, had very, very high standards. He only made recordings of works that he wanted to do at the end of his life, and all he wanted to do was the same old standard German repertoire. And he, he, did, he did that um, after demanding lots and lots of rehearsals and all kinds of, you know, special conditions to, to work his magic, and quite often he did but he's competing with himself. And he was competing with himself in the worst way. I mean, five or six Bruckner nines within a few years. You know, anytime he conducted a Bruckner symphony, RCA had the microphone set up and it got issued as a recording. There were Berlin ones, there were NDR ones, there were Cologne ones, they were all the same repertoire. They were all very musical performances. His Schubert Ninth was one of the great ones. It was wonderful, but go find the best version. There's the Berlin one, there's the NDR one, there's the Cologne one. The best one is the NDR one. Most of his best recordings were the NDR ones. But then they stuck him in front of the Berlin Philharmonic because of course it was the Berlin Philharmonic. The truth is, especially under Abado, the Berlin Philharmonic ceased to be one of the world's best orchestras as far as I'm concerned. They had their issues, and whether they had their issues or not, they didn't play with the same kind of enthusiasm and finesse that the NDR orchestra played under Gunter Vond. Maybe it was because they tried harder, or because they knew each other better, or because he had more time. I don't care how great a conductor is in front of, you know, with, with minimal rehearsal, but you just fly somebody and it's not going to be the same as the results you get with... Uh, people who've known and worked with each other for a long time and who know what they expect and what to do and all that kind of stuff. And I just find, I just find Gunter Vaughn's output, his late output, to be extremely frustrating because great as it is, and it is absolutely wonderful, he is competing with himself. And, and it hurt him to do these Berlin Philharmonic recordings because finally people listened to them. I mean, no one was paying attention when he was with NDR or these other, they went, oh, it was Vaughn, it was Berlin Phil, it must be the greatest ever, and it wasn't. So people got behind the wrong horse. He is the classic example of how being, 
you know, mindlessly duplicating repertoire can damage your career or at least damage the listeners, your audience, or hurt them by having mindless people recommending, you know, the wrong performances. And he must have been happy with them. I'm sure he was. And listen, they're not bad. They're not bad at all. But they're just not great. And he did greater. He did better. He was competing with himself. And that's the whole issue. So there you have it, my friends. I mean, I don't want to keep beating this particular dead horse. But you, you hear what I'm saying. I can't include in a list of conductors who never made a bad record, conductors who never made bad records, but they made dozens of duplicate records which are not of equal quality. You know, they don't have to be bad to be just not interesting after a point in time. And that's what happens with these guys. They are a unique phenomenon in the history of classical music recording, of that explosion of things brought on by the advent of the compact disc and people changing labels and, and, and the, 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 what you call the merger and, 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 and growth of the you know, classical music industry, the consolidation of all these catalogs and just a few, few ginormous corporations and the, the competing with each other and Sony competing with Deutsche Grammophon and Universal. And the result was mindless A&R, mindless artist and repertoire decisions that did not benefit the audience or the listener. And ultimately, the artists are responsible for that because they don't have to make records. There's no reason they should go make records unless they really feel strongly about a record. But when the, but when the paradigm is find a famous guy, set up the microphones anywhere they are and issue the result no matter what, what do you think is going to happen? So keep on listening, friends. Thanks for joining me. Take care.